Is there a madman with a brain to turn the stuff of nightmares sane? And demons crush and chaos tame, who'll leave his realm, forsake his bride, and tossed by contradictory tides, give up his pride for pain? Is there a daughter born in dreams, whose flesh is snow, whose ruby eyes stare into realms whose substance seems strong as agony, soft as lie? Is there a girl child born of dreams, who carries blood as old as time, destined one day to blend with mine and give new lands a newer queen? Is there a brave lord birthed by fate, to wield old weapons, win new estates, and tear down the walls time sanctifies, raise ancient temples as hallowed lies, his pride to break, his love to lose, destroying his race, his history, his muse, and relinquishing peace for a life of strife, leave only a corpse that the flies refuse. I love The Witcher and Elric almost equally. Nope, they're gonna hate that. <laughs> Hello there, fellow Witcher and Elric love. Nope, that's too familiar. I love fantasy books and so do you. No, 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 no. Please don't hurt me, I have a child. <sighs> Hello, I'm the proper bird, just a bird with a story. And today we're talking about Elric of Melnibune on our very first episode of the channel rebranding. I guess. This particular subject was requested by a master of the universe, specifically Septic, on my Patreon, and he asked me to compare Elric of Melnibone to Geralt of Rivia. Please put down your pitchforks. I have absolutely no horse in this race. I, I know I have been a Witcher channel in the past, and I have the Witcher tattooed on my body, and I have all of the Witcher games several times, not making a very good case for myself right now. Geralt. Elric. You're back at it again, I see. At one point I intend to dye my hair black. Oh, don't bother. They'll call you Conan instead. Oh, by my little sagging tit! This is not the first time I've been asked to talk about Elric. I've had this question for as long as I can remember since making my first Witcher story video roughly four years ago. I never really had the time to look into it, and having done my research now, I think I still didn't have the time to look into it. But apparently Elric is kind of a big deal, and the Elric vs Geralt debate has been raging for a while now. So, we're going to try and figure out whether Geralt ripped off Elric for his aesthetic and so on. And just to be clear on this, if you're here because you'd like to hear someone hate on either franchise, you're in the wrong place. I really love both series, each for their own reasons, but there are problems we need to talk about, so we will. I don't think it's a big secret that I'm an unapologetic Witcher fan. I've read the Witcher books far too many times, played the Witcher games to rags, and sometimes dream of broody one-eyed elves. And you are. I had never read anything Elric related in my entire life. That's a problem. As a Witcher aficionado, I felt I was going to be very biased in regards to this subject. If I didn't know enough about Elric to make a fair comparison, I risked falling into the Elric bad, Geralt good trap. So, to remedy the situation, I decided to read seven Elric books. This was a stupid idea, as it took way too long to do, but at least now I know a lot more about Elric. And while seven books might sound a bit random, I promise you it's not. The very first Witcher story, titled very simply The Witcher, was released in the fantasy magazine Fantastica in 1986. So, I decided to follow the order of the Elric books listed in the current physical books, starting with Elric of Melnibone and other stories. Please don't at me about the pronunciation, this is how Michael Moorcock himself said it. Which includes nine books, seven of which I read. I didn't read two of them because they were written after 2005, so it didn't make much sense. But I did read a 2001 book, so I could compare Ciri to Elric's daughter Una. There is also one book that was written three years after the Striga story was published, and another book that was written after the first short story collection of The Witcher in 1990. If the series sounds confusing already, then you are correct, because the Elric saga was written completely out of chronological order, which means a lot of people are left trying to figure out where to even start, and eventually how to carry on. So, let's start at the beginning, and please be warned, I will be talking about spoilers in the Elric and Witcher saga going forward. However, I will only compare the books, not the games. The games were based on Sapkowski's work. We're trying to figure out what Sapkowski might have taken from Elric, not CD Projekt. 
And I'm definitely not including The Witcher Netflix show because, uh, well, they're just making stuff up as they go. So, book spoilers ahead for both series. If you don't want to hear any of that, I can tell you at least that if you enjoyed The Witcher, there's a good chance you'll enjoy the Elric saga as well. The first Elric story was written by Michael Moorcock in 1961 and appeared in Science Fantasy, which was a fantasy and science fiction magazine in Britain at the time. And that's our first parallel, actually. Witcher's first story appeared in 1986 in Fantastica, a Polish fantasy and science fiction magazine. From then on, Morka continued writing novelettes for that same magazine, like Stealer of Souls and Kings in Darkness. There were ten in total, and the series actually had a very definitive ending. Elric dies in the Doomed Lord's passing. The trouble is, in making everything a novella, it made the story really fragmented. Most characters didn't really have a backstory, you didn't really know how they got to the things they had, and it didn't help that Moorcock kept writing stories after the fact. Except these stories now took place during the other novellas. So eventually, when they decided to bundle the stories together, Moorcock wrote some more stories to explain how Elric got his sword, why he's so good with all the magic nonsense, and he had to re-edit and remove some passages to make it make sense. If you look at Elric's Wikipedia page, you'll notice one section in the internal chronology section that just says, chronology uncertain. We literally cannot tell where Elric is doing things, and I'll explain why in a minute, because we're not done with Elric's humble beginnings yet. Outside of just books, Elric was also written into several comic books, starting in 1971, but he wouldn't pop up in America until 1972, and not even in his own comic book series, no. He joined Conan the Barbarian in a completely original story. From that point on, Elric kept popping up in various comic magazines published by various companies, and the quality of said appearances, uh, varied wildly. Occasionally Marvel and DC too, though not primarily. Eventually he finally got his foot in the door and adaptations were created for Moorcock's actual books. Studios like Dark Horse, Boom and Titan picked them up, but didn't get very far into the saga, unfortunately. Not strange, given the amount of material out there. Apparently Titan is still creating comics though, and Moorcock was quite pleased with their work, calling it the best adaptation yet, and I absolutely agree with him. Interesting to note in the case of the comics is that a lot of them changed the stories here and there. Most notably again, the Titan series. For example, Stormbringer and Mornblade, two very important weapons in the Elric saga, are said to be Arioch's daughters in these comics, and they literally talk to their wielders. Arioch being a Duke of Chaos, very powerful dude, just trust me on this. Elric also undergoes blood rituals to regain his strength instead of taking various potions and the like. You might think that would irk Moorcock, but quite the opposite actually. He noted that he enjoyed a good amount of the changes and even said he might have preferred it if he'd written the story their way in the books. So what you're saying is you could have had a literal Lady of Chaos in your belt instead of a raging shadow man inhabiting your sword. Yep. And bloodbaths with ladies instead of gross herbs and potions. Yep. You want to talk about it? Nope. These are the most notable mediums for Elric as far as I can tell, but this man spread his wings everywhere, let me tell you that. This might surprise some of you if you've only just heard about Elric, but he was kind of a big deal in his time and maybe still is. Bands wrote music specifically about Moorcock's entire saga, and some bands even named themselves directly after the characters, like Hawkwind or Tigers of Pantang, and sometimes Moorcock even collaborated with the musicians. So, now you know that Elric was a big deal, and there was a lot of Elric to go around and all that, but here's the funny thing. The stories of Elric focus on Elric himself, of course, but just as much on his sword, Stormbringer, and the world around him. And trust me, this gets very confusing very quickly. Moorcock uses the theory of the multiverse in his stories, and he really does go all the way when it comes to infinite worlds and infinite possibilities. Elric is only one of his creations in the multiverse he created, and while he is the character he seems to have focused on the most, he technically isn't even the main character as such. I'm going to try my very best to explain this without confusing myself. The multiverse is a very common, though highly questionable theory, even in our very own, very real world, that poses there's an infinite number of worlds, each with their own little differences and their own little quirks. It's somewhat more complicated than that, but Elric's world simplifies that concept and at the same time makes it very difficult to follow in the books themselves. In Moorcock's universe, every plane, every world is connected through something called the Moonbeam Roads. 
these moonbeam roads make it so that any character from any world can visit other planes. And that makes it easy for Moorcock to write about whatever he wants. It's actually an infinite possibilities kind of scenario. And to that end, Moorcock created the Eternal Champion. Within Moorcock's multiverse exist several forces. There's Chaos, also known as Entropy. They are the forces that create random chance, luck, freedom, creativity, etc. There's Law, also known as Singularity. They create stability, structure, justice and morality. And then there is the Cosmic Balance which keeps the two, well, balanced. None of these forces are inherently good or evil. They are all necessary to keep life balanced. Too much chaos turns the world into a writhing heap of nonsense, and too much law removes basically any and all features, making the land barren and lifeless. Either force is defeating the other means the end of the universe itself. This is why the cosmic balance created the eternal champion of balance. The Eternal Champion is reincarnated over and over and over again, each time in a different body and time, to ensure that the balance is kept. Moorcock has written books about the Eternal Champion more so than individual characters. Elric is one, but so is Hawkmoon, Obek, Erikos, Ulrich, and Jerry Cornelius, who I haven't read about, but is described as a physicist, assassin, politician, super spy, rock star, messiah, and former clergyman. So, a humble sort of man. So why aren't you like uh, a lot of things, like the Jerry guy? I am. I'm a sorcerer, emperor, and a swords guy. Well, you're an emperor of nothing at this point, really. I'm a very good swords guy. So a magic sword guy? I am also that. I'm a much better magic sword guy, trust me. You don't even have a sword on you. I couldn't get it across the Canadian border. At least I don't have to wear a silly hat. I don't always wear a silly hat. It's so the viewers can tell us apart. Ah, you admit the helmet's silly though. That's good. I wonder if my sword likes Witcher souls. Because all of these Eternal Champion stories essentially take place in the same multiverse, they can all meet and hang out whenever Moorcock feels it's appropriate. So at one point, for example, because time works in mysterious ways, three Eternal Champions meet each other, one of them Elric, and one of them uh, claims they've already met. Except two others don't remember that, because the person who says we've already met did already meet them, but in his time, in his multiverse, and uh, yeah, I guess the other two haven't done that yet because their time hasn't flowed that way? While Elric's original saga certainly has a beginning and an end, and even a somewhat proper chronological order, it doesn't really matter. I told you before that the Elric saga as listed in the physical current books included a set of nine books, but there's a catch. Technically, Elric dies in the sixth. The following mini-saga, called The Moonbeam Roads, includes three other books, but in those books we sometimes run into Elric from a time before the sixth book where he dies. Why is this a little silly? Well, because in book seven, Elric finds out that he has a daughter and also a son who had likely already died. Reading the seventh book, even though it's not from Elric's perspective, tells us that this encounter has a huge impact on him. But as this story was written after the initial saga, we never see any of this reflect in Elric's life otherwise. In the original saga, Elric never mentions his daughter, Una. He doesn't mention the probable future offspring of his son, Count Ulrich von Beck, but the villain from those three final books does make an appearance in the original saga. And this is even stranger because in the original six books, that villain also appears in a strange in-between stories story. And that particular story is so strange and out of left field, I can't even begin to describe it to you. And he is not the only character that behaves like this. Various characters make repeat appearances because the multiverse exists and thus we have endless possibilities. Although it's likely Moorcock just had rough drafts of where the story was going otherwise, without any details, it still reads a little weird. And this is the main reason the Elric books can be kind of hard to follow. But with all that out of the way, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Elric so you have something of a frame of reference before we start comparing him to Geralt. Elric of Melnibone is the rightful emperor of the great Melnibonian race. A race of cruel, proud, beautiful people. And I mean, really, they were the worst kind of people. Apparently they were in the habit of gathering particular slaves specifically for their vocal pitch when they screamed, so that their unified screaming would make for good music when they were tortured. That's the type of people you're dealing with here. And Elric was their emperor. He sat on the ruby throne, the great throne of Imrir, 
The dreaming city of the Dragon Isles, said city was protected by the Sea Maze, making it impossible for anyone to attack the island without a Melnibonian guiding them through the maze. And even if somehow someone managed to attack the Melnibonian kingdom, they had dragons. In Elric's world, they are called the Forn. Melnibonians are not actually humans, they're something else entirely, and some say it's because they mate with dragons, but no one's truly sure. Whatever the case, though, Elric's people have a bond with the Forn and can wake the creatures to defend their lands or to attack people. Whatever they wish, really. By the time Elric is born, Imrir has already become lazy. They think they're unbeatable entirely and just sit around torturing people all day. Taking various herbs, drinking, etc. Elric, whose birth resulted in the death of his mother, was despised not just by his father for killing the only woman he ever loved, but a fair few Melnibonians hated him too. There was talk that he was the beginning of the end, that he'd destroy their way of life and their kingdom as a whole. And indeed, after Elric took the throne, fewer children were born every year, and the dragons were no longer breeding at all. Having been born an albino on top of his weak blood, Elric is too weak to stand on his own and requires herbs and potions to keep himself going throughout the day. If he doesn't have access to these potions, he can actually die. Because of this, his cousin Yerkun decided that he was better suited for the ruby throne and often challenges Elric outright. However, Elric proves himself the better emperor and from that point on, Yerkun keeps trying to bait him into doing something stupid. That's largely where the story starts. Now, Elric as a Melnibonian is already an outcast in more than one way. Melnibonians were traditionally extremely competent sorcerers. The best in the world, in fact. Why? Because the Melnibonian race as a whole had made a pact with one of the Dukes of Chaos, Arioch. On top of that, certain Melnibonians were permitted to go on dream quests. Elric was one of them, and was even expected to do so as the future emperor. A dream quest basically worked like this. They went to sleep on a couch, and while sleeping on said couch, their spirit would leave their body to go questing about. In Elric of Melnibone and other stories, we see the origins of Elric and everything surrounding it, and that includes the dream quests. In his particular quests, he first lays eyes on his famous black blade that would later come to him in the form of Stormbringer, his own sword. He fights a Chaos Lord, calls for Arioch for the first time, one time he takes over the body of Elric of Melnibone, yeah, El Elric with a K this time. While on a dream quest, the person dreaming absorbs all of the experiences, memories and knowledge from whatever person they inhabited at that time. They could be dreaming for an hour, but their spirit might be gone for years on end. This was how the emperors of Melnibone became so disgustingly powerful. Elric learned how to talk to dragons, made pacts with elementals and gained new spells. So. Elric, being as powerful as he is, only really held back by his status as an albino, surely wouldn't have much to fear. Wrong. Melnibonians are emotionless, cruel creatures. You know, the Witcher stereotype. Elric was not. At least not entirely. I mean, he still was, but he also likes to pet the occasional animal, probably. Elric thought too much. He thought about the future, about his kingdom, about not wanting to be an emperor. All things a Melnibonian emperor shouldn't worry about. They should only want to maim and slaughter and torture and... Because Elric wasn't about that, dissenting voices started to emerge. There were some that thought Yerkun would be a better emperor, because he was, in fact, the worst, like everyone else. Added to that misery, Elric was also in love with his cousin. The, the other cousin, Cymoril, not, not Yerkun. Uh, and they loved each other very much. This was perfectly normal, apparently. And they were even set to marry, except then everything went wrong. Because suddenly the barbarians made it through the sea maze and Melnibune had to fly out on their golden ships to go and stop them, which they did. Except Yerkun found time in the process to accidentally kill Elric and declare himself emperor. He even went as far as to say he was going to marry Cymoril, which you know, is his sister? Yeah, Yerkun is just a step above being gross, somehow. And from this point on, it's just supernatural shenanigans after supernatural shenanigans. Elric summons elementals of all kinds, chaos lords, actual angel people, it honestly has no end. The only problem is that Elric is really very dumb a lot of the times. You see, eventually he captures Yerkun, but then he wants him to suffer slowly and horribly, which gives Yerkun time to escape. And he even takes Cymoril with him. 
But then, even though Yerkun is trying to be clever about it, Elric finds him again, except he fled through the Shade Gate to the Realm of Chaos to find some extremely powerful rune blades. So Elric follows him, finds him again alongside the rune blades, Stormbringer and Mornblade. The two fight, Elric wins, and what do you know, Elric doesn't want to kill Yerkun. In fact, he bargains with Arioch, the Duke of Chaos, that he wants Yerkun to return home with him from the Chaos Realm, otherwise he wouldn't play nice. So then they return home and he... You know what, let's play a game. Does Elric A immediately execute Yerkun, B exile him forever while stripping him from his possessions, or C does he make him Emperor of Melnibone? Any guesses? It's C. The answer is C. He makes Yerkun Emperor of Melnibone, so Elric can go backpacking all around the world for a while because he clearly needs a sabbatical. Does that sound like a monstrously terrible idea? Good, because it is. Trust me, I'm not doing Yerkun's complete insanity justice here, because guess what? Skip some time ahead, and to no one's surprise except for Elric, Yerkun has betrayed Elric for a third time, now proclaiming Elric an outlaw and a traitor. So, Elric, logical-based Elric, decides to recruit a bunch of sea lords from the Young Kingdoms to attack Imrir and just burn the whole place down. Except for Yerkun and Cymeril. Except when they finally get there, Yerkun throws Cymeril in front of Elric's sword, and then she gets her soul sucked out of her body by Elric's fancy new soul-sucking sword. Elric is very dumb a lot of the times. Elric's fancy new soul-sucking sword, Stormbringer, doesn't just suck souls because it likes to suck souls. It also transfers their strength to Elric. So, if he kills enough people with the sword, Elric doesn't have to use herbs anymore to stay alive. And that's great, except sometimes the sword gets a mind of its own because it's secretly possessed. So it starts killing Elric's friends. And that just doesn't happen a few times in the books. That happens constantly. And Elric is weirdly chill about it. It doesn't really stop to break him up until the only friend he has left is Moonglum, his best friend. And at that point, even Moonglum starts to get the jitters. Ah, oh, no! I killed another one! My dearest friend, why must this blade torment me so? Oh well, let's get on with the quest. Mother, pray collect me post haste, for I am fearful. <laughs> Moonglum, my dear soul yes. friend! Where Make haste. Art thou? Yours forever. Moonglum. At that point, Elric finally starts to realize that um, maybe it isn't a great idea to pull out his sword around his friends anymore, except it's too late because he's already killed a whole gaggle of friends. Elric is really very dumb a lot of the times. But at other times, he's suddenly an absolute genius. When it comes to war, combat, sorcery, trickery, he has no equal. And I like to think that this strange disconnect between his decisions can be attributed to him being a Malnabonian. All of his awful choices are rooted in what amounts to people skills, or lack thereof. He keeps trusting Yerkun and giving him second chances because Elric doesn't truly realize the type of man his cousin is. Elric is the rightful emperor of Melnibone, and the Melnibonians by and large respect the royal blood enough not to challenge that in any way, shape, or form. Yerkun is different. Even for Melnibonian standards, he's quite vile. When Elric defeats him and gives him the throne during his little vacay, he does so because he cannot fathom the idea that Yerkun might betray him again, might oppose his obvious power again. Surely by now he's won his respect, and if not that, his fear. He genuinely doesn't grasp the concept of a man that doesn't fit his idea of how a Melnibonian should act. When it comes to his sword murdering his friends, the people's skills he lacks are more so applied to himself. Being in control is Elric's thing. He's rarely defeated, and when he is, he always finds a way out regardless. The sword is different. Stormbringer and Elric are practically one and the same, and the blade is as headstrong as Elric is. When he first obtains the weapon in the Realm of Chaos, it tries to kill Yerkun, and Elric stops it from doing so, yelling that he was in control, not the sword. Elric truly believes that and continues to believe it long after the diabolical thing proves him otherwise. While he is technically the master of the blade, it takes advantage of Elric's fatigue after every fight, silent moments between combat or the times Elric stops to contemplate his decisions. The sword seems to actively wait for a moment of weakness before it takes each of Elric's friends, be it battle rage or melancholy. Elric's growth unfortunately comes too late, when Moonglum is all he has left and he realizes that no, maybe he isn't always as in control as he'd like to think. 
Having said that, sometimes Elric is just really very dumb generally. This one time he goes off traipsing around the dream worlds with Un, who is a dream thief and, you know, the future mother of his daughter. And she has been in dream realms often enough. She knows exactly what to expect. Elric, he even says it himself, has never been to a dream realm. He doesn't even know what dream thieves are until he meets Un. So what does he do? Does he listen to Un every time she says, don't do this? No. No, no, he doesn't. Oh, that's shiny. I'm going to touch it. Do not do the thing. I would really like to do the thing. I'm telling you not to. The thing is dangerous. I will brood over this for the foreseeable future. And that's not the only deal with Elric. He's a pretty intelligent guy. You know, Melnibonian emperor, probably had a really good education, a sorcerer. He's just top of the line. Sometimes pretends to be smarter than my cat, which is obviously a lie. Except he is fighting the literal gods of his world. He can't just go up against them as a mortal, no matter how powerful he is. So a lot of the times, it comes down to what Pokemon he picks. Elric's sorcery largely consists of him summoning other creatures to do his bidding for him. Because of his Melnibonian blood, specifically because he's from the royal line, he has made a pact with most elementals in the world and a whole bunch of chaos demons and lords and ladies. And they do the fighting for him. This has problems in and of itself. For example, at one point Elric summons air elementals to do his bidding, and a different sorcerer counters his air elementals with fire elementals. Said fire elementals are a terrible counter, we all know how blowing out candles works. Except in a different story, our heroes are fighting air elementals, and so a sorcerer summons fire elementals, loudly exclaiming that the spirits of air fear such beings. Do they? Do they though? Inconsistencies aside, that also seems to be the extent of Elric's magic, which is weird because he's supposedly, compared to the rest of the world, the most powerful sorcerer available in our current roster. He teams up with a different, very human sorcerer in another story, and that sorcerer is very cool. His name is Drenich, and he should have taught Elric his tricks before he died almost immediately. Elric's summonings usually took quite a while, and a lot of energy to complete, but Drenich just says a few quick words, makes some hand-wavy gestures, and he stops arrows in mid-flight sending them back to the attackers afterwards. He apparently had the power to remove the bones straight out of his enemies, turning them into flesh heaps. Elric's father had the power of prediction. All Elric has is some very disturbing dreams every once in a while. I think I've told you enough about Elric by now, so you can paint a rough picture. So, it's time to compare them one-on-one. -on -one. Elric of Melnibone versus Geralt of Rivia. Gather round the fire, and I will tell you a tale. From the bottom to the top, let's start with appearance. At first glance, you might say that, yes, Geralt is a complete straight ripoff from Elric. And you're not entirely wrong, but when it comes down to it, they do have certain differences. It just doesn't always come through on the artwork. You have to read the descriptions in the books to realize that, no, they're technically supposed to be maybe opposite brothers. The only straight crossover, weirdly enough, is the hair. Elric was born an albino, except, you know, the imagined albino stereotype. So on top of snow white hair, he also has bright red eyes. So he was born with it, as you might say. Whereas Geralt had perfectly natural hair before and didn't get his snow white mane until he went through the trial of the grasses for a second time, because he was just that good at it. The white hair basically indicated that he had become a super witcher. In accordance to the witcher mutations, he has yellow eyes. On top of that, Geralt is not described as being particularly beautiful. The opposite, actually. He scares little girls. Most people who want to sleep with him just want to do so for the experience of having slept with a witcher. Elric, on the other hand, is breathtaking. The Maldabonians are a very pretty race, and Elric was no exception. And it's not just implied, no, he's just straight up described as beautiful, though cruel. I also do have to add here, Melnibonians do not have elven blood, and I honestly have no idea where this is even coming from. Is it the pointy ears? Because Melnibonians do have somewhat pointy ears. I haven't come across any actual verifiable elves in the Elric universe so far, just races with pointy ears that are elf-like. Not everything with pointy ears is an elf. Outside of the ears, they are not at all like the Tolkien elves. So that's the superficial stuff. But here's the thing about appearances. It's not just in the details. When you put the two characters side by side, you'll see what I mean. If you know nothing about either character and you were only given a quick look of the two, 
you'd probably say they were the same person. Geralt is a broody, white-haired swordsman in medieval dress. Elric is a broody, white-haired swordsman in medieval dress. Was Geralt copied point by point? No, but it's certainly not far off. Having said that, the broody knight archetype has been done before. Granted, Moorcock was one of the first to do this type of particular anti-hero style, but Geralt is not the only copy that spawned. There's still a problem with how Sapkowski went about it, however, but I'll include that in the end when I talk about the authors. Is that important? Yes. Yes, it is. Let's move on to the personalities. I'll save us some time. They are basically the same. Down to the moping. Although Geralt is generally... nicer? Elric spends entire pages at a time brooding and moping about his fate and all the bad things that happened to him. Then he follows that up with deep thoughts about the universe and what it all really means. Geralt doesn't spend entire pages brooding in rapid succession, but he does brood a rather large amount of pages. And I think in this case, it's just down to the writers and how much detail they enjoy. Moorcock is definitely part of the Tolkien school of let me describe this particular tree in excruciating detail. It was a tree like no other. Vines embrace the chaotic branches, desperately reaching for the last gasp of the sun's rays. It seems frozen in time, beautiful yet mournful in that moment. Its roots might dig as deep as the multiverse itself, for all it mattered. It stood motionless. The wind tugged at its stubborn visage, but this giant would not- Get on with it! <laughs> yes, yes! Sorry, sorry, coming. What it comes down to is, uh, well, the classic anti-hero archetype, I guess? Except, at the time, it wasn't really a classic archetype at all. Moorcock practically created it with a bunch of other people at the time. They were the frontrunners of this archetype. It's popular now, I guess for a reason, but Moorcock was definitely still original at the time. Just to put this into perspective, the Elric saga started in 1961. The Lord of the Rings, the first book, Fellowship of the Ring, was written in 1954. Now, having said all this, you might think that the Emperor of Malibune has little in common with the wandering witcher who kills for money otherwise, but you'd be wrong. There are quite a lot of instances where you can very clearly see Moorcock's influence shine through, and yes, I am going to outright call it Moorcock's influence because that's what it is. After reading the Elric saga, I am absolutely convinced that at the very least, Sapkowski took some rather heavy inspiration from certain aspects of Moorcock's world, and at worst, he copy-pasted bits and pieces. Mind you, I'm going to start by telling you about the things The Witcher did that were very similar to Moorcock's books. That's not to say they're a straight copy. Please refrain from being silly on your keyboard until the video is actually over. Remember earlier when I talked about Elric needing to take potions to survive? You're going to say, well, that's not the same as Witcher potions, and you'd be a little bit right only, but don't worry, that's not the only comparison. In both cases, the potions being consumed work to strengthen the user, there's simply no denying that. However, if you'd argue that in Elric's case he'd die without them, then how about this? This particular affliction doesn't really bother him anymore after a certain point in the book. I believe the last time it's actively brought up is during the story The Fortress of the Pearl, where his physical problems cause him to fall into the story in the first place. Stormbringer, his sword, can sustain his energy without herbs, and eventually he does come to rely on it instead of herbs. He still takes a potion here and there, though, potions that serve to improve his abilities in combat. For example, a literal immunity potion. Both characters are very fond of their potions, to be sure. And before you come at me with, well, Elric doesn't do it all the time in the books, neither does Geralt. Ciri also has a counterpart in Elric, or, you know, technically the other way around, I suppose. Una, that's Elric's daughter, white-haired, and she can travel through time and space. Yeah, really. And you might say, well, we don't really properly meet her until Dream Thief's daughter in 2001, but she technically already appeared in the Fortress of the Pearl in 1989, except we don't really meet her. She's mentioned in the poem, and the one that I opened this video with. Uh, she's the second verse. That's about his daughter. Well, let's move to another comparison, and this one is incredibly blatant, actually. The conjunction of the spheres. So, as I was scouring the internet, I came across this comment rather often. The Witcher ripped off the conjunction of the spheres. Now, this confused me a little because I didn't read anything about any conjunction of the spheres in the Elric saga, as far as I could see. Just a few hints here or there. And I was right, because it wasn't in the Elric parts, it was in the Hawkmoon parts. Hawkmoon being another eternal champion, of course, who deals with Elric from time to time. So, I, I guess I read an eighth book? In the book that talks about the whole ordeal, 
the quest for Tanalorn, this is what I gathered. Interestingly enough, the event is not common knowledge in Morcock's multiverse. In fact, Hawkmoon spends a lot of time trying to figure out what it even means. It also added a few words. Technically, it's called the Conjunction of the Million Spheres. It is a time of great changes on all existing planes. The event itself is rare, and when it occurs, it allows creatures from different planes to cross over to other planes. Sound familiar? It should. That's what happens in The Witcher during the Conjunction of the Spheres. I have nothing more to say about this, it's honestly pretty blatant. And before you ask, because I know someone will, the quest for Tanalorn was written in 1975. Next, let's move on to the character's day-to-day -day business. As the Emperor of Melnibone, you mean? I hear you ask. No, actually he doesn't do that a whole lot. By the end of the third book, Elric has stopped his Emperor business altogether, because he destroys the Empire he would otherwise be ruling over. At this point, he becomes, in effect, a wandering monster slayer. Yes, really. Elric's world is fraught with monsters everywhere you turn. Creatures of chaos and creatures of law, summoned to do their master's bidding, and Elric runs into them constantly, such is his luck. Sometimes he'll be paid to do this or that, and of course it will include monsters. Sometimes he's just trying to go places, and what do you know, ambushed by monsters. Geralt of Rivia, in comparison, also just goes around finding monsters to kill and hopefully get paid for it. Do they do it for the same reasons? Not always, no. Elric is generally not going out of his way to look for monsters, he's just also fighting monsters. The weird thing here is that while Geralt is technically a monster slayer only by trade, most of the Witcher books don't actually talk much about the monster slaying. It's Geralt on a journey, coming to terms with who he is, what he wants, the people he cares about, things like that. He's chasing Ciri more than he's chasing monsters, and also he slays monsters occasionally. So, on the monster slaying level, yeah, they're pretty equal. So what do you do on an average day? Oh, you know, slay some monsters. Same, same, same. Sip some potions to become the best version of myself. Same, same, same. Discuss the conjunction of spheres with my fellow intellectuals. But same, but... You know, as Hawk Moon. Do we just become best friends? Favorite dinosaur in three, two, one. Velociraptor! <sighs> Man, you're so basic. Okay, we've worked out most of the big ones, so let's rattle off a few that I don't really have too much to say about. There's a story in Moorcock's universe about outcast, elf like creatures living at World's Edge having been driven there by humanity, who came into their world after the elf-like creatures were already there. They are hated by humanity, live strangely long lives, and ally themselves with creatures they call halflings. I will now point towards the Witcher books, where a story exists that is literally called The Edge of the World, that deals with the elves that were driven there by humanity, who came into their world long after the elves. The elves are hated by humanity, live strangely long lives, and when some of the elves create the Scoia'tael, they are joined by non-human allies, such as halflings. At one point in the books, Elric is joined by a character named Weldrake. He's a rather jolly bard who writes ballads about Elric's ventures. Yeah, that's pretty much Dandelion. Although, trust me, Weldrake is gross and creepy and we hate him. I'm not allowed to say the word on YouTube because they'll demonetize me, but he's a bad person by our standards. Dandelion might sometimes also be gross and creepy, but just not in the same way. On the topic of side characters, however, Another young lad joins Elric on his journeys more permanently by the name of Moonglum, and I do see a lot of people comparing him to Dandelion. I will tell you right now that I don't see that one. Moonglum is nothing like Dandelion. Yes, he's a friend to Elric when others generally are not, but he's just not the same character. The only trait he shares is that he likes to sleep with women, and that's not exactly original by any stretch. Moonglum is also an expert warrior, whereas Dandelion really isn't. Don't worry though, we have more side characters, but honestly this one I thought was mostly amusing. The Lovers. Remember how I told you that Elric was just one form of the Eternal Champion? Well, guess what? There's also an Eternal Companion, yes, one of them is Moonglum, and an Eternal Consort. One of those Eternal Consorts was Cymoril, raven-haired of course. His second consort is Zarozinia, red-haired. That's right, Yennefer and Triss parallels. But it gets better. He also meets two other lovers who are not eternal consorts. Michelle, a raven-haired sorceress, is one of them. Yes, really. Elric sleeps with her and has a whole relationship type thing going. And then later, after she died, he runs into another sorceress called the Rose. She has red gold hair and blue eyes, like Triss, whom Elric has a thing for, but doesn't start a relationship with. Isn't that funny? I think that's funny. Don't take this one as a serious point of contention, I just thought it was an interesting observation. There's a monster in the Elric saga that is literally called Jack Three Beaks. Yeah, that's pretty close to three jackdaws, isn't it? 
Uh, this one really makes me feel like it's just a homage because it's so tiny, so small. It's kind of cute. Elric's nickname is the White Wolf. Geralt's nickname is the White Wolf. They don't receive their name in the same way, of course. Elric is called such after the raid on his own empire, destroying Imrir in the process along with most of his people. Geralt practically immediately gets it after the trials, named so because his hair turned white after the trial of the grasses and because he's a witcher from the school of the wolf. Now, wait, stop, stop, I can hear you furiously typing in the comment section. No, White Wolf was not a common moniker back then. The ones you are probably thinking of right now? Go check the date on those. If they were created after 1970, which is when The Singing Citadel released, in which Elric was first called the White Wolf, then Elric's got you beat. Like the Witchers in Geralt's world, the Maldivonians are also dying out. Very much a, a relic of a forgotten time type trope, I know, but it's technically a parallel. Also, neither book can ever shut up about destiny. Neither of them. And neither destiny is very happy, really. Although I guess Geralt kind of cheats because of Ciri, but I like happy endings, so I'm okay with that. Hey man. Hi. Doomed by destiny. Oh yeah. Sucks. You too? Oh, super doomed, super doomed. Any chance of uh, averting destiny? What? No, absolutely not, it's my entire arc. Cool, 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 cool. You got any escape plans yourself? Are you kidding me? My own sword wants to drink my soul. Ah oh, yeah, no, it makes sense. <laughs> so, uh... Yeah, no, we can absolutely play Gwent. Oh, thank Ariok's golden buttocks. I thought you'd never ask. Elric did the Shades of Grey thing before it was cool. I'm not gonna give him any points for this. Yeah, technically that is a similarity, but this one is so common, you really can't trademark it. And I know people are going to bring up the chaos and law thing. Sometimes Geralt says there's chaos and there's law, and technically, yeah, that's a parallel as well. But again, those are very vague concepts used by a lot of people, so still, even if it is an influence, I don't think it's a huge deal. Both lands basically deal with, well, everyone isn't really just good or just evil, and that's fine, we're all flawed human beings. You know, in Elric's world, there's, there's chaos and there's law, and the eternal champion balances both. And then in Geralt's world, you have people being awful and people being awful, and that's perfectly balanced. Hello, sir. I have found your cat and saved it from the monsters. Oh, thank you, sir. I am very poor, but I could give you my very last penny. Oh, no, there's no need. I wouldn't take your only money. Oh, thank you, good sir. Bless you. Right, I'll just be going then. Newton freak. Oh, come on. I know, I said I wouldn't bring the games into this, but um, for those not in the know, yeah, this happens in the books too. There is no good or evil in the Witcher world either, but whenever anyone writes a gritty fantasy, that seems to be the case. Or rather, they reject the notion that there are pure and beautiful heroes and instead tell you that everyone is flawed. Which is fair, and again, pretty general. And yes, sometimes Geralt will say chaos and he might even say law and order, but that doesn't mean that the concepts are one-on-one, -on -one, okay? All right. Just as an example, in the Elric saga, the Nazis are forces of law. Let that one sink in. Also, yes, there's a story with Nazis in it. Several, actually. Both characters are rejected by the normal people around them. Elric is the scary Malnabonian that everyone hates. Geralt is the scary witcher that everyone hates. But everyone still comes to both of them when they need help defeating the big bads. Also, both characters wield swords with runes on them, which is nice. Except Geralt's sword isn't an evil, soul-sucking menace, which is nicer. Oh, and also, Elric starts to wear a headband at some point. You know, the headband Geralt wears in the books. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you were trying to suppress that memory? Understandable. Okay, let's just stop right there for a moment. Those are all the comparisons I wanted to bring up today. Does that mean that the Witcher straight up ripped off Elric? Well, we need another chapter for that. What we've discussed up to this point were all characters, various elements within the world, the world itself and things like it. But are the stories alike at all? No, emphatically no. Geralt's main focus at practically every point in the books following his short stories is to find Ciri, protect Ciri, bang Yennefer, find Ciri again, be a proper father to Ciri, make new vampire friends, etc. Whereas Elric's entire story revolves around him trying to mess with the Lords of Chaos and Law, 
He's wandering around the land and every time we jump into his story, someone's being the worst to him. It'll be his dead father telling him to go grab his favorite box, or his ghost will possess Elric's body forever so he can tell his son how much he hates him for all eternity. It'll be Thalep Karna cooking up another dastardly deed to thwart the albino swordsman because his girlfriend has the hots for Elric instead of him and his ego can't handle it. It'll be a ghost ship of destiny that takes him to a weird island with several of his eternal champion alter ego so they can fusion dance and turn into one giant eternal champion being so they can have a Power Ranger giant monster versus giant monster dance off to save the literal universe. Elric has some very, very weird things going on in his life and it makes Geralt's life look pretty tame by comparison. And that's okay. Geralt's story is personal. It's about his found family and trying to get through life together. Whereas Elric's story is universe encompassing. He's just destroying the entire universe by the end of his books and also every god. And then his sword comes to life and kills him too. It's hard trying to raise a kid these days. Oh, tell me about it. She keeps running off and I have to chase after her. Oh, it's the worst, isn't it? You have any kids? In the timeline somewhere, sure. Though I see my sword as my child as well. Ah, just you and them against the world, huh? Yeah, in the most literal sense of the word. Yeah, uh, we have to destroy the entire universe together and then it will kill my only friend left in the world, after which it will attack me and drink my soul so that I may suffer forever in doomed limbo. Yes, I can see the kid parallel. Right? Yeah, no, no, I see. It's just so much pressure. And that's the next point on the list, actually. The stories don't just differ in scale, they differ in tone tremendously. You might look at the overarching similarities and think, well, the world's similar enough, so are the characters. I suppose they all behave and talk much the same, but they don't. Elric's world is bleak, and they will let you know. I did just mention how Stormbringer ends. There's this doom looming over the entire world constantly. The fact that the multiverse exists the way it does in the books means that destroying entire realities every so often and just reforming it is pretty normal in case Moorcock wants to start a new storyline. After all, he can continue writing stories with those same characters through use of that same multiverse. Daughter of Dreams was written after Stormbringer, where Elric dies. But in Daughter of Dreams we still have Elric around, even though he's not the main character. He's simply summoned from a different point in his time. Essentially, Moorcock's characters live forever, so he can destroy them in horrible ways and get away with it. At least in the Elric saga, hope is not a concept you'll come across often. In contrast, we have the Witcher books. Is it bleak? Oh yeah, definitely. Do Geralt and Yennefer still die by the end of the books? Yeah. But then Sapkowski dips into the Arthurian legend and just says, actually they went to the Isle of Avalon, Adabal Avalach. <laughs> and uh, then they live happily ever after. And then Ciri goes to the literal Arthurian legend to also presumably live happily ever after. The Witcher does have storylines that don't have a happily ever after, but at the same time, they're not universe destroying. The Witcher often has a sense of humor. Terrible things could be happening, but at some point there's levity in the form of Dandelion being an idiot on purpose to cheer Geralt up, or Regis saying something he thinks is very intelligent only for Milva to tell him to shut up. Elric doesn't have that. When they do incorporate humor, it's generally wry sarcasm, not ha 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 humor. People do a lot of torture dying, which I guess makes Elric laugh at least. On that same note, the style of writing differs greatly too. I mentioned Tolkien before, and as much as Moorcock doesn't actually seem a fan of Tolkien, his writing is more similar to his than it is Sapkowski. You know how sometimes there will be prophecies or weird old-timey elf speech and such in the Witcher books? Elric is almost exclusively written in that way, at least in the earlier stories. And it doesn't help that Moorcock often goes on tangents for what seems like forever, much like Elric's moping or my videos. On a more personal level, Geralt's just a nicer guy as well. Which isn't that hard considering Elric's a Melnibonian and they are by nature very cruel, even though Elric is a mellow version of that. But still, the guy lets his horses die of exhaustion way too many times during the books because he doesn't know how travel works. And also he has a giant swim himself to death in lava. That one's kind of funny actually. On another note, Elric also has a lot of side characters, but the only ones Moorcock ever cares to flesh out properly is the Eternal Champion. I'm serious. Elric does not like sharing the spotlight. And don't get me wrong now, the side characters are wildly interesting. Generally speaking mysterious, but that's okay. I just like to know a little more about them and we don't really get that. We're always reading about how Elric feels and what Elric thinks of the situation and how Elric is going to kick everyone's butt so hard. But that's it. The most we ever get character development wise will be the villains and of those, only really two of them. Yerkun gets a few pages to himself and so does Thelep Karna. 
But past those two, there's precious little to go on, even for future villains. One of the big ones in the later parts is Gaynor the Damned, or after that, the dragged Yagreen Lern, the guy who starts the whole end of the world nonsense. We have no idea what they're thinking and why, but they do get a lot of I am very evil screen time. If only there was time to develop their characters outside of the outwardly evil things they do, especially in a book series that prides itself on having no true good or evil. But those two? Well, I don't see any redeeming qualities whatsoever. And if we're going with the idea that yes, good and evil do exist, it's just that the Lords of Law and Chaos don't work that way, then, well, that's even further removed from The Witcher. And speaking of The Witcher, it has quite a lot of point of view chapters. Yes, Geralt is a character most people will know and heard of, however, he's not the only main character. His daughter, Ciri, gets quite a lot of chapters to herself, as does his destinied wife, Yennefer of Engerberg. Really, the time between them is more split than you might think. And it's not only them. No, everyone gets a little time to themselves if it serves to broaden our horizons. From Emir of Emris to Vache to the one army guy who's counting catapults, if there's something interesting to be said from their point of view, then it's generally going to be said. It serves to give us more of an insight into the lives and world of the Witcher itself. How the people feel about the war, what's happening to the little people, the rebels, royalty here and there. When it comes to Elric's world, I can scarcely imagine how Joe from the corner shop feels about Elric whooshing by to suck the soul of his wife, no pun intended. Elric dealing with these grand plots constantly certainly doesn't help in that respect. But this is ultimately why each of these stories feels so different. The Witcher is a much smaller, more intimate story. If you've read the books yourself, you'll have noticed that what Geralt does throughout this journey doesn't actually affect permanent change very often. And when he does, it isn't universe encompassing. He's the guy who helps a villager here and there through their troubles for the most part. Says, stop bullying the non-humans a little more loudly from the sidelines. His biggest claims to change are the battle on the bridge, without which Queen Meave could have very well died, and lifting the curse on the Striga princess of Temeria. And even when it comes to those, they are not actually all that impressive in terms of world events. His adopted daughter, Ciri, as powerful as she is, doesn't even change anything at all. She's the lady of time and space and could probably pull off some Elric-like shenanigans, but she doesn't. You might say, well, if Geralt didn't exist, then Vilgefortz might have taken what he needed from Ciri, and then the world would have been very different. And that's true, but if Geralt didn't exist, Ciri also wouldn't have been at Vilgefortz's castle, because she wouldn't have met Yennefer, whom she tried to rescue at said castle. She would never have been captured at all. And though she might still end up with Vilgefortz after the fact, we can't know that, because it didn't happen. In contrast, if Elric didn't exist, I don't even know where to begin. Like. The world wouldn't have ended, which which is somehow a bad thing, actually, because it needed a restart. Uh, Tanalorn the Eternal might have fallen. Uh, Melnibony would still be thriving. Um, uh, Nazis would have won, and they would have been led by an actual chaos demon, like a literal actual chaos demon. Uh, and his right hand would be a guy who uh, abandoned Satan because he wasn't evil enough. As an aside, if Elric really wanted to, he could definitely be a lot smarter about using his resources. It's largely irrelevant to the story itself, but Elric has access to a literal invincibility potion that he can remake indefinitely. Even by the end of Stormbringer, he has around a hundred dragons left at his disposal, but throughout the series, they just keep waking up the whole batch at the same time instead of a few at a time. If he did, he could have actually solved the majority of his problems in a few seconds, which would have made for a very boring story, but I'm just saying. Hey, so I heard you have immunity potions. I mean, I guess. Can I buy some? Oh, uh, no, we don't have them at this very moment, like right now. No. Shall we go make some? Well, it, it's a lot of effort. Are you... are you serious? I'm a little tired, so... They are immunity potions. Oh yes, they're very neat. Anyway, I'm gonna go wake up the entire dragon host so I can play air volleyball. Right. Okay. It's time to talk about the authors. I'm going to come right out and say it. Sapkowski does not portray himself as the nicest guy around. Outwardly, anyway. I have no idea if when you get to know him he's actually the nicest guy you will ever meet, but whenever you see him in interviews or read about him, it's just a grumpy, grumpy interview every single time. It's not a secret that he's not a fan of the games. I wouldn't go so far to say that he actively hates them, like some might claim, but he's certainly not wild about them. Even though, as most people know, the games have done great things for him. Like land him a Netflix show, for example. The whole world knows the name The Witcher by now, but unlike Dmitry Glukovsky, 
who is always happy to talk about the Metro games, Sapkowski's not exactly happy to talk about the games his book spawned. In fact, he even sued Seda Projekt for more money pretty recently, because he didn't make the deal he should have made way back when Seda Projekt started their Witcher franchise. Sapkowski didn't believe in the games then, and he was mad about it now. And maybe a little bit about the fact publishers kept changing Witcher book covers to screenshots of the games. Or by now, I guess, the Netflix show? But this is the image the interviews I've read and seen about him paint of Sapkowski. A slightly bitter old man who doesn't think highly of video games. Which is a shame, because I adore his books, and I wish I could adore the writer all the same. I'd love it especially if he could talk about the Elric saga at some point, because I never hear him talk about other writers or stories that directly influence The Witcher. And Elric surely influenced his books. Sapkowski used to work as a translator for science fiction stories in particular. Interestingly enough, Elric was translated to Polish in 1985. The first Witcher story was written in 1986. Sapkowski would have known about Elric, especially as it was a very influential story at the time. But if that isn't enough, did you know there's a website where Sapkowski lists something he calls the canon of fantasy literature? Well, it does, and it lists the Elric saga too. Now, this is a problem with more than one author, obviously, but we're talking about Sapkowski versus Moorcock, and Michael Moorcock stands in sharp contrast to Sapkowski in this case. When it comes to Sapkowski, he'll often reference a Polish folklore and fairy tales and things like that as inspiration for the Witcher books, at least partially. And I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that that is true, 100%. Except that wasn't the only inspiration, was it? Elric was one too. Moorcock, you'll find, will not stop giving people credit. They could beg him to stop, but he's going to keep telling you about all these other amazing writers that influenced his work. Have I told you about Bertolt Brecht yet? He'll shout, while standing on a table during a fan meeting. What about Fletcher Pratt? I really like him. He influenced so much of my work. I just like the story of Kullervo. Oh, and Monsieur Zenith. I liked him so much, I put him in my book. Anthony Skeen wrote that one. He's a very important influence on my Elric saga. Let me tell you more. Wait, come back. Let me tell you about other authors. Sapkowski will praise individual authors well enough, but he will never mention the word influenced. Perhaps he feels the inclusion on his list of fantasy canon should be enough? And if any Polish fans are watching and they know of an interview where he did talk about this, please let me know. Having said that, from reading both books and after seeing the fantasy canon list, I do get the feeling that Sapkowski honestly and genuinely doesn't see the issue here. He might think that his work speaks for itself. I called it the conjunction of the spheres, where do you think I got it from? And perhaps this is simply a cultural thing that anyone outside of Poland wouldn't get. I'm afraid I can't answer that. I can only tell you how I feel about the matter, and since this is my video, well... Did the Witcher rip off Elric? Yes. Although rip off might be too strong of a word, but that's strangely not really the problem I have with this. Honestly, people rip off other stories all of the time. There are no real original stories left. Everybody takes inspiration from somewhere, that's not strange. The world around you is going to influence you. And writers, surprisingly, will have read a lot of books, and they, unbeknownst to them, will always influence them. If everyone kept telling each other not to use their very original characters, do you know how many great stories would never have been made? If Tolkien kept rising from the grave to tell people not to use my elves or not to use my dwarves, do you know how many fantasy novels would never have been made? Many. The answer is many. When it comes to Elric of Melnibune, he's a stereotype now. Yes, very much so. I posted a picture of me with the pretend Elric helmet and the white hair, and yes, I know the helmet isn't a proper replica, but it's angry and pointy, so it works. I asked on Twitter who they thought I was. Unsurprisingly, since I used to do a lot of World of Warcraft content, a whole host of people guessed the Lich King. Yes, I can see that. White hair, broody, roughly similar helmet, sword. Heck, the white-haired anti-hero is a straight-up trope by this point. Should Morcock be angry at all of them? Because at the time, his character was, in fact, very original? No, and he isn't. In fact, he wasn't even mad at Sapkowski at all. Other people kept talking about how Morcock sued Sapkowski. That isn't true. Elric has been an influence to so many other works already, and Morcock is generally just pleased to see it, interested in most. The problem arises only because Sapkowski doesn't care to properly credit Morcock for influencing The Witcher. And this is especially troublesome because, as it turns out, people are turning down the Elric saga for film projects because it reminded them too much of The Witcher. The Witcher and Elric are two vastly different stories. They have similar elements, and I'll be damned if I didn't accidentally write down Geralt half the time while taking notes for the Elric books, but the stories are different. Elric fans shouldn't have to suffer just because The Witcher exists. 
And the Witcher shouldn't be attacked constantly for being an Elric clone. It isn't. But where the Witcher has a constant sense of humor, Elric has sweeping fantasy settings that are genuinely more original than 90% of the fantasy stories I've read in my life. And I've read a lot of them. Where the Witcher has a personal story to tell about a small group of found family, Elric's story deals with the entire weight of the world, of gods and multiverses, of deep morality, and the tragedy of destiny and fate. The Witcher itself, from the short stories onwards, reads more like a cohesive narrative. Likely because they don't use the multiverse as such, it has a very solid beginning and end. Whereas in Moorcock stories, anything can still happen. Which, yes, also means that the majority of the stories amount to the oh no, they captured the princess setting, and a lot of the villains angrily shake their fists while quoting Dr. Claw. And I really like that type of storytelling. The short stories from The Witcher are my favorites. I much prefer them over one long narrative. With Elric, you can practically jump in anywhere and still enjoy the story. Because, really, even if you don't know who the characters are entirely, it doesn't matter. They're telling you a whole new story from beginning to end. And when that particular short story is over, you just move on to the next. For completion's sake, I do feel I need to add this as well. The fact that Elric most definitely influenced Sapkowski's writing does not make The Witcher unoriginal all of a sudden. I've seen this far too many times in far too many comment sections. The Witcher creates a lot of concepts on its own, adds rich lore to its characters and its world that has nothing to do with Elric. Sapkowski didn't walk into Elric's world with a literary handbasket to pick a few stories to then paste Geralt over every passage with Elric's name in it. Again, The Witcher is its own story with its own characters and its own world. Influence does not equate to straight copy. Which is why both are worth your time. Both are amazing stories, and honestly, Elric does not get enough recognition as it is. If you haven't read Elric yet, then, you know, despite my spoiler warnings, go have a read about the true original Witcher. And if you haven't read The Witcher yet, go read that one too. Please don't tear each other to shreds in the comment section. I love both these series. Although, yes, I am slightly more a Witcher fan, but mainly because at the time it did save my life, and I like a bit of humor in my books. I think I'll read more of Moorcock's books after this video, at a more leisurely pace this time and without needing to write down notes and summaries constantly. I really appreciate Moorcock as a person after all the interviews I've watched of him, and honestly, that just makes me want to know more about his work, even though he doesn't think too highly of Tolkien. I do have a question for those of you who have read both series, though. What are your thoughts on this matter? Do you think Sapkowski went too far? Do you think it isn't a big deal at all? If you haven't read one of the series, or perhaps neither, how does this make you feel? And congratulations on making it all the way to the end of the video, dang. Addendum to that, also let me know if you're more of a pancake or a waffle person. Personally, I do like a good dinner pancake. Anyway, do enjoy the rest of your day, and as I am still primarily a Witcher fangirl, va fail. Right, so our respective fan bases will definitely hate the other guy. Oh, absolutely. Someone will bring up Polish pride in the comments, I bet. Someone else will yell about the purity of early fantasy and sci-fi writing. They'll definitely bring my games into this. We're going to talk about whose comic series is better. Oh, for sure. Wanna go mess with my weird multiverse world? Ah, oh, fun! Do you have any raven-haired sorceresses? We are so in tune. So you guys gonna be uh, cool heroes? Oh, absolutely. Have I ever told you about Wall? guy the robin yeah, yeah true story it's an actual robin but a, like a magical robin and he just spreads joy wherever he flies it's pretty amazing if you ask me oh they sound amazing have i ever told you about Loch Muin? oh yeah like it's a place in my world sure but the person i mean the person Loch Muin. amazing person actually a dragon didn't want to tell you this, but yeah, there's diamond dragons too. It's just a step up above golden dragons, you know what I mean? But uh, I'm, I'm in the know. I'm in the know. They let me in on this. Oh, sounds cool. Sounds cool. Yeah, yeah. Now we got Septic as well, yeah. Not sure what part of the universe he's in, but wherever he goes, people just keep talking about cats. Not not like the cat, cat, not like purring cat. No, no, just, just cats. It's a concept. I'm not sure what he means by it, but... I think he's immortal and he's never going to stop. Well, I could also tell you about MJS Coolsta. I mean, it's a sordid story, really. Very powerful being, very powerful being indeed. I didn't think the universe was gonna survive their existence for a moment there, but then it turns out they're also really cool. Yeah, it just keeps happening with these masters of the universe down that oh wait until you hear about mike Zvirs. oh yeah yeah no this is a good one so he blew up the sun because it was summer and it was just too hot 
and he wasn't having it. So he blew up the sun for just a little bit so it could cool down, and then he made a new one. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what multiverse it was, but uh, I'd like to hang out. All right, all right, all right. Have I told you about Robertson S.O.? Yeah, 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 yeah. Single-handedly wrestled a sea snake to death. I mean, just wrestled them to death. Because they were bored. Yeah. Yeah, it was a feisty one. Feisty one. I mean, both of them, but mostly Robertson S.O. because he, he killed the sea snake. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Last one. Adrian Beckel. Oh, oh, you've already heard the name. Oh, okay. Well, that makes this a lot easier. Yeah, no. Uh, solved the debate from cats and dogs. Uh, turns out they're both really, really cool animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't know what he did, but he balanced the scales forever, and now everyone just agrees that both cats and dogs are really, really cool.